especially when the sun is out, you're a lot in a dark room, so I kind of pity you in many ways. You've heard a lot of the statistics and the facts, and it's, you've heard them many times before, I'm sure about that, and they're very depressing. People listening to them is depressing because they're stats, they're income paper, and they're projections for many people. They're actually our family, our children, our parents, our grandchildren. So that we're them stats, so we're looking at the stats while we are the stats. And of course we're all concerned about suicide, why wouldn't we? Children left, right and centre, young as nine, ten years old, taking <coughs> life. That is not normal in any culture. The key issues affecting travellers, well, Colette has touched on several of them. And if you break them down in institutions, you could say that the key issues are travellers have issues with education. Travellers have a legal system, such as overrepresented prison. Travellers have issues with accommodation, such as local authorities. Travellers have issues with, what was the other one, legal, political representation, physical, or institutions, we are familiar with them. The question is, how did we end up here? How did we, as being labelled travellers, itinerants, tinkers, how did we end up in segregated institutions, segregated education, um, denied access of health services and employment? So I put up this kind of, uh, it looks like it's going back into the past. You know, a lot of people say, oh, history, I don't want to hear about history. Don't talk about history. But you think about it, there isn't a person in this room that hasn't studied history, but you just don't call it history. You might call it microbiome. You might call it sociology. You will research the origins. You'll research the history of that. And then you become informed. So by learning from the history, you become informed in the present to what to do. So the present day, as we pointed out, the key issues. So we we're wondering, why, why would even 50 years of support, why would even having three or four national travel organizations and numerous travel support groups, why was there funding, investment, programs, and then we ended up getting worse, worse and worse. We need, you know, support. We need uh, guidance. We need, you know, influence from this government, and we need funding to tackle the, the mental health uh, issues and suicide rates that's happening within the community at present. Could I mention the 1963 report, which is called the Report of the Commission on Itinerancy, 1963, 8th of August, and in there they talked about travel mental health, that it was balanced with everybody else's. They talked about confidence, intelligence. They said travellers did not feel inferior to settled people. And then you go 60 years later where travellers don't know who they are. They're being misrepresented, applied with labels that people don't fully understand, such as ethnic. There's nothing wrong with the word ethnicity. But when you take a people who are from the land, and you tell them they're an ethnic group in their own community, and they're also like the Roma. The Roma and travellers are not alike. We have similar cultures as all cultures, and as um, Ferber Shanahan might mention, that these cultures are very similar, what they call pre-industrial cultures. In other words, people have to live some way, and there are a lot of familiarities. When you start to realise, all for a second, we're on the same island, we barely left the same locations, we got the same skin complexion, we got the same surnames, and you're trying to tell us we're aliens and we came from somewhere else. Long, the traveller lineages have been in Ireland. The traveller lineages that we saw, many of them were about 4,000 years old and they had been in Ireland for that long, just the same as the settled people's lineages have been in Ireland typically that long. So, many sociologists, and no disrespect them, including Trinity College, Manute College, Cambridge University, Oxford University, Belfast, uh, Queen's University, all put us into 1922. They told us, do not go any further. There's nothing back there. Your problems began in 1922, and then some believe it began in the 1960s. Because if you look at the 1963 report, they picked out some of the finest minds on the island. I'm talking about the Supreme Court Judge Ruler, the Department of Education, the one of the Garda Shikana, the head of that, and the heads of all multitude of institutions. Of course, it's no surprise to say who was not invited. There was no travellers. So why would these people in 1963, after Irish independence, referencing old English laws? Why would they talk, and let's use the 1824 Vagrancy Act on them. Let's use the 1847 Vagrancy Act. 1847 kind of rings a bell, doesn't it? That's the time of the Great Famine. 
many, many people died. In Dublin, they signed off a vagrancy act telling these people that if they moved out of that location in 1847, they would end up in prison. Of course, many of them ended up dead. So we were all full of questions as why, 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 in the same way when I was a child. Because we didn't grow up in destitute. If we grew up in destitute, we would be very happy to get out of it. We would have accepted any terms. We came from a cultural world that we knew as children there was differences. Not superior or inferior, just different. So when we arrived in 1922, because obviously this is the formation of the Irish state, this is the new beginning, but it wasn't, unfortunately. When we got there, we started to realise, hold for a second, these institutions are not Irish at all. They're all English. In actual fact, the Prime Minister at the time threatened Ireland that if they moved or changed the four key institutions that travelled are having issues with today. In other words, if they moved the political system, if they changed the legal system, if they changed the educational system, if they most certainly changed the land rights system, the whole of England would obey Ireland again. So technically, Ireland is living under threat of war if they change anything. If we knew that as children, I think we would have seen the world differently. Instead, we were told all of these are Irish and you are not. You are a different Irish. In actual fact, you are a failed Irish. And that kind of destroyed the community, even at this present moment. Again, I'm not berating uh, the state, the government. I'm not berating national travel organisations. These are physical institutions. And if you're young enough and you grew up in one of these class systems, you would perceive that, you would receive that, and you would see that as reality. As a child, one culture, two culture, a few cultures, it does not matter, the mind will absorb the information available. When we got to 1922, we said this is, this is something obviously not right here. So where did the institutions come from? Where did the, all these institutions travel to having issues today with come from? So that we ended up back in the 16th century, which sounds like a really long time ago. But when you think about it, 1922 is playing havoc today. And if these systems came from here, that means the 16th century is playing havoc right here with travellers. So when we get to the 16th century, we realise these institutions were designed to crack down on a particular aspect of the Gaelic world, of the Gaelic clans. They went after the bards, they went after the Galadas warriors, they went after the harpers, the poets. They were called martial law. Martial law was specifically designed to destroy these people in any which way they could. It wasn't all of the Gaelic culture. If you were settled and you were doing your farming and doing whatnot, you were left alone. But if you were moving around, you were a target. So they come up with what they call vagrancy acts. And the first vagrancy act was, I think, 1536. Now, vagrancy act is, the idea in the English was to, anyone who moved would be punished. You could be whipped, you could be beaten up, you could have the air chopped off, you could even get transported off the island. So the idea, when you think about that, the vagrancy acts were to keep people settled. Not just about the people who are moving, but keep them settled. So in this year, also, they set up a thing called surrender and regrant. So the English went up to the gate of cheese, and they said, look it, we're going to kill you because we need the island, or we'll give you nice titles, we'll give you certificates, and we'll make you very popular, and you can be called barons and lords, and this way the lord, or Hugh O'Neill, and so on and so forth. So they accepted these terms. But the deal was that they had to abandon their travel or their travel culture. They had to abandon their Gaelic culture. They had to give up their ways of life. They had to adopt an English language, adopt English clothes, adopt English rules, and adopt an English culture. So you had Irish children from there on in growing up in an English environment with an Irish name and identity. When we got there, we started to realize a lot of other things that there was a guy called Edmund Spencer. Um, he was the English poet slash soldier. Because if you were carrying a sword around with you, obviously you're more than a poet. Now he had some crazy ideas. He thought, if he wrote to the Queen and told the Queen to put up hedgerows to stop these Gaelic tribes from moving. And then when you get them there, put the sword to their tongue and make them speak English. Make them dependent on the state. Um, that was Edmund Spencer's idea. And of course, people would say, well, Edmund Spencer's idea never, they never happened. Convinced they actually did happen. 
that we have never truly been represented for seven hundred <coughs> six years, five months and 22 days when the Irish chiefs wrote to Pope John uh, II complaining about the, well, what they would have called them the Middle Nation people. So one time in the past, Dublin was called a Middle Nation. In other words, they were answerable to an empire such as the Christian Church at the time, and then beyond Dublin were just people. So they were the Middle Nation people. But it was around that time, the Irish chiefs said to the Pope, we're being ran off our spacious lands, we're being hunted down, we're being turned into slaves, we've been killed, we've been forced to live in the bogs, we've been forced to live in the rocks, and we cannot even get peace when we get there. That sounds a bit familiar to me, what's happened with travellers even today. Uh, constantly moved on. And in the 63 report, he talked about that. He talked about how to put pressure on these people and eventually break them. So they told the guards to use all the excessive powers as you possibly can. Then they decided they would contact London and ask London how would they deal with the problem. Because obviously they had experience. They'd been here for hundreds of years. That wasn't too bad. They contacted Northern Ireland. That wasn't too bad. They contacted France, Spain, Portugal, uh, West Germany, and various other countries. They asked them, what do, how do you deal with your itinerant problem? Because they already labelled us itinerants, despite the fact these people said, we are not itinerants. We understand what itinerant means. In the west of Ireland, up in the 50s, there was a lot of settled people who were itinerants. There were itinerant doctors, itinerant nurses, itinerant vets. So they would move. But in the 40s and 50s, that was clamped down by the state. So we go back to the 12th century. And this is the beginning part. This is the beginning of all our problems, I must say. It's, this is when the Norman invasion begins. So these guys came to the island, came to pretty much Dublin, and they said to everybody else, we're now the new Christians. We're the true Christians. You're the mock Christians, and we're going to kill you if you don't move. That's exactly what happened. What happened then, no, sorry, that was the physical um, institution. So this is the belief system, where these people believed that they were superior, and the people on the island were inferior, and they had a right to rule over them. And that was what called a, was called a horizontal colonization. In other words, it was kind of just going through for a few centuries. There was no real big deal about it. It's only in the 16th century where the English decided they were sick and tired of uh, the Christian empire, that they were going to create their own empire. They decided we're going to put up our own institutions. So they put up King's Inn, they put up Trinity College, and they put up various other institutions that would go on educate the rest of the nation. Moving forward to the, with the mentality, right to 1922. Now when we get to 1922, at this point, a lot of Irish people had already absorbed a lot of the English culture. Like we're speaking in the language of the English people. It's not what we think to say, but we speak in it. But we also adopted a lot of their culture. Like if you went around today in Ireland and asked people about any of these institutions, they would say they're Irish. But in reality, they couldn't be Irish. So when we get to 1922, yeah, yeah, it was in 1925, it was actually the wonderful Brent Smith um, who had mentioned, um, actually I have to clip here as well, but she mentioned about 1925, I think it was uh, some actor or another. This is when the state started to take a focus on travellers. But it wasn't just travellers. And this story, what we have at Trav Vision, isn't just about travellers. Because when you take off the label traveller, I was called traveller, I was called Tinker, I was called Itinerant. So I was called all these three labels, and all these three labels are hundreds of years old. So when we remove the labels, we're talking about a human experience, a human life. And when you read the stats and the facts, you will see that we're getting psychologically crucified, destroyed, and we don't know why. We, we, we're told one thing, we're led down a path, we're told five years this, rally behind that, roll in behind this, let's have another campaign. And in year after year after year, their own stats and reports have been telling them something isn't right here. But like the 12th century who believed that they were the superior people, just like when the English came again as a Protestant form, believed that they were the superior people, when it came to 1922, which was quite a sad, tragic time, because people killed each other for their beliefs. Now, if you were in the Pale or Dublin, you grew up in that world, you might want to give it up. You'd be terrified of who might take it over, would he seek revenge on you? So there was what they call the Civil War. Now I won't go too much into that because it's a civil war in a settled context, but outside that you could say it's a colonial war because one side wanted to retain the same English systems that had dominated on the island for centuries. 
right, so back into the present day. And I keep saying this because if you listen to any geneticist, he would tell you that all human life is 99.9% .9 genetically related. In other words, every modern human being on the planet has one ancestor. Everybody in Europe, everyone with the skin complexion, blue eyes, share two ancestors. So if you're English, German, French, settled or traveler, it does not matter. Genetically, you are related. You come from the same origin. So what we're looking at is an absolute accidental uh, colonization, a different kind of colonization. We went through all the physical stuff here. You know the famines, there was over 30 genocides. A lot of people died, a lot of people kicked off the island, transported, put to very parts of the world. And, and we ended up here, yeah, talking about very complex issues. Uh, and at the same time, trying to simplify them to tell you that the settled people, um, which is a complex label in itself, got history wrong. They got it backwards. They've been psychologically colonized. And that's a strange thing to say to people because I know this is an old story. There isn't one thing, I mean not one thing that we made up. We didn't say Trevor said that and we said this when they didn't. It's recorded. We were just presenting the facts. If you look around at all the buildings, we'd say there's evidence. We're on this very same foundation that went unchanged in 1922. We told the world that Ireland was a proud Irish people who fended off a big bad old empire. But why did in 2024 have we got the same systems that were not changed in 22? set up in the 16th century. And why do settled people not know their own history? Why do they not even know where the term settled came from? In the 12th century, settled is where the settled people come from. It's that identity, not the people, because you have the same name. This is not about names, it's nothing to do with geneticists. It's about psychological belief systems and cultural belief systems. And in that particular year, it was what they called uh, English settlers. So it was the first settlement started, you would say, in Dublin and it expanded outwards. It took the four shires. It took the whole eastern part of the island. Now, by law, you have to send your child into this educational institution where they're never going to tell you anything about you, but tell you, look to the future, uh, next five years, next 10 years. So I'm not sure if any of that makes any sense to anyone. Um, I'm not surprised if it doesn't. But we would say one more time is that uh, we have no animosity towards settled people. There's never been a report ever written where travellers were asked, how do we feel about settled people? What do we think of settled people? Not one report. Every report I've ever seen was about how much the settled people hate travellers, how they wouldn't want to live with them, how they wouldn't want to work with them, how they wouldn't want them near their families. And we were saying to these people who were representing us, we know this. You do not have to come up to with traumatised people reminding us how much we're hated. And of course, again, when we get into the whole identity stuff, it's about representation. Like if you went to any country and there was a group of people who were represented by a group of people who are not from that culture. I mean, we're, we, there has been, here's Nan Joyce. Yeah. The first traveler organization that was ever set up was by Nan Joyce and a couple of other travelers in the 1980s. They were shut down. The government came in, pulled the funding, closed them down because they got political. After that, clearly after that, Nan Joyce was never let near an NGO again. That was, that's just a fact. So why did that happen? How did a prominent, iconic woman like Nan Joyce get kicked out of the movement? The movement was taken over by upper middle class people. And that's just the truth. That's just a fact of life. And they've never left their positions. I mean, never left their roles as coordinators and as uh, directors. And the travelers are the same travelers in the organization for over the years. And that's a sad reality. So it comes down to psychology. How can I go around representing women? How can I represent someone with disability? How can I represent someone from a different ethnicity and different culture? And I think a lot of the representation part has come down to why we're having these stats. Because travellers in the 60s were confident. The travellers in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s were confident. They knew where they came from. They knew their history. They didn't know it as good as any other scholar, but in their own ways, they knew who they were. So I just want to show a quick clip of RTE. I forgot about the clips. Um, a quick short of, uh, yeah, RTE clip would be better. 
There's around 30,000 travellers here in Ireland, but a lack of documented historical evidence means the origin of their community is a matter of some debate. But while this study does provide useful information, further research is still needed, so travellers can learn even more about the road that leads back to where it all began. Will Goodbody, RTE News. Yeah. Uh, can we go to the image of Margaret Sweeney? This is my granddad, and she said this in 1986, which was long before um, Fergus Shannon came around with microbiome, although I'm sure he was working that time. It was long before uh, the geneticist told us there was a divergence between 360 and 420 years ago. So uh, I read it, which is also okay. I think that the travelling people are the true Irish people of Ireland, and no travelling person should be ashamed of what we are. We should be proud of it because we came from real Irish people. Our ancestors fought for this country and they had to leave their homes just the same as I'm sure some of yours had to years ago. Now is the time for the politicians to stand up and realize that we are Irish people. We have a right to be in this country. We have a right to say where we want to live. We have a right to live the way we want to live. And it's not up to anyone else to plan how we should live. Margaret Sweeney, University College, Galway, October 1986. Travellers knew who they were. The problem was settled people forgot who they were themselves. The role that their clans play throughout our history, their music, their culture is hidden from us. It's hidden from traveller children, but it's also crucially the wealth of that and the richness of that is hidden from non-traveller children. And that creates a reliance on negative stereotypes, a sort of reliance on a cycle of racism and discrimination. The state as a whole from its foundation made a decision that travellers were of no real value and set in process a motion of assimilating. Segregation is still ongoing with travellers. People don't know that. They don't realise that right up until recently, just like in America in the 70s and the 80s, when only two departments of the government would deal with a particular community. And in America with African Americans, it was the Department of Justice and the Department of Health. Who was dealing with travellers for the last number of decades? The Department of Justice, the Department of Health. So these are the similarities that we also have with many other uh, cultures and communities around the world. I'll finish off briefly by saying how we are connected to the rest of the world, apart from the microbiome, apart from the genetics part, but psychologically. When England came to Ireland, it had colonised it. It had set up physical institutions. It had dominated a new foundation. It created new systems. For centuries, it was about, first of all, segregation, keep the wild Irish away. But when they started to realise that if we force assimilated them, we could make them into British subjects. And a process began over centuries. And that's why a lot of people don't notice it, because it goes on for centuries. Last paragraph um, of your reply, where you actually say that Minister Josephine Madigan and her department are responsible in relation to the budget for travellers and culture. So I want to ask both of the ministers here, I put down a very simple question to ask the Minister for Culture, Heritage and the Gaeltox her plans to establish funding for artists, projects and institutions dedicated to highlighting the place of traveller culture and history in Irish society and if she will make a statement on the matter. And I got a reply with the Minister refusing to take the question, but putting the travellers into the Department of Justice. We assimilated them. We could make them into British subjects. And a process began over centuries. And that's why a lot of people don't notice it, because it goes on for centuries. And we are a people on this island for a very, very, very long time. And we've been denied our own right to express this story. I've been at this over 20 years, and this is the first time that a travel organisation actually had called me in second time by the same person, Patrick Nevin, who I owe a great uh, deal of gratitude. We understand that uh, identity is very triggering. Like if you're a pale person or a West Brit or a culture or a Protestant or a Catholic or a nationalist, we would say, be the hell whoever you want to be. We don't care. That's not an issue. Because they're all colonial labels. They all originated colonisation. After hours of thinking about what I wanted to say, 
and how to phrase how important I think this bill is. I came to the realisation that I was finding it difficult because I can speak about my own experience of stigma, social class and barriers in education and experience of deprivation and so on. But it must be said that no matter how difficult the things that I have experienced, my traveller friends have experienced so much more. So I'm going to finish with that and thank you very, very much for taking the time to put up with this presentation. <laughs> O'Brien, 22 years old. Paddy Hutchison, 26 years old. We see it all of the time in our community that I think is slowly dying. John Connors, 30 years old. Eamon McDonough, 25 years old. We're talking about a national crisis. There's so many travellers taking their own lives. Michael G. Ward, Diana Gavin, Willie McDonough, Jimmy Lynch. Thomas McDonough, 17 years old. Katie Ryan, 15 years old. Sienna Marie Reynolds, 13 years old. Patrick McDonough, 12 years old. It's my Patrick.